perceived in the books the number of years that, according to the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet, must pass before the end of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. Then I turned my face to the Lord God, seeking him by prayer and pleas for mercy with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession, saying, O Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, we have sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled, turning aside from your commandments and rules. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. To you, O Lord, belongs righteousness, but to us open shame, as at this day to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and to all Israel, those who are near and those who are far away, in all the lands to which you have driven them, because of the treachery that they have committed against you. To us, O Lord, belongs open shame, to our kings, to our princes, and to our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him, and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God by walking in his laws which he set before us by his servants the prophets. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside, refusing to obey your voice, and the curse and oath that are written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out upon us because we have sinned against him. He has confirmed his words, which he spoke against us and against our rulers who ruled us by bringing upon us a great calamity. For under the whole heaven, there has not been done anything like what has been done against Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this calamity has come upon us, yet we have not entreated the favor of the Lord our God, turning from our iniquities and gaining insight by your truth. Therefore, the Lord has kept ready the calamity and has brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all the works that he has done, and we have not obeyed his voice. If you would, turn in your hymnals, 428. Let's stand while we sing.
Lord God, as we come now to your word, we thank you for the great privilege it is to study scripture and apply it to our lives, and we ask that the Holy Spirit be our guide to your truth for us today. Thank you for this great hymn of our dependence on you. And thank you for each one here today, and we ask that as we begin this day in praise and in prayer and in scripture that you would meet us. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. (coughs) Well, we opened our chapel time today with a reading of the first half of Daniel chapter 9, which we're going to focus on today and tomorrow. So now let's uh, continue and read the second half, beginning at verse 15 uh, to the end of the chapter. And now, O Lord our God, who has brought thy people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand, and has made a name for thyself, as it is this day, we have sinned, we have been wicked. O Lord, in accordance with all thy righteous acts, let now thine anger and thy wrath turn away from thy city Jerusalem, thy holy mountain, for because of our sins and the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and thy people have become a reproach to all those around us. So now, our God, listen to the prayer of thy servant, to his supplications. and For thy sake, O Lord, Let thy face shine on thy desolate sanctuary. O my God, incline thine ear and hear. Open thine eyes and see our desolations and the city which is called by thy name. For we are not presenting our supplications before thee on account of any merits of our own, but on account of thy great compassion. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, listen and take action for thine own sake. O my God, do not delay, because thy city and thy people are called by thy name. Now while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, presenting my supplication before the Lord my God in behalf of the holy mountain of my God, while I was still speaking in prayer, Then the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision previously, came to me in my extreme weariness about the time of the evening offering. And he gave me instruction and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I have now come forth to give you insight with understanding. At the beginning of your supplications, the command was issued. And I have come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed. So give heed to the message and gain understanding of the vision. Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy place. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be built again with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. Then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the Prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary, and its end will come with a flood. Even to the end there will be war, desolations are determined. And he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week, but in the middle of the week he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering, and on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even a complete destruction, one that is decreed, is poured out, on the one who makes desolation. We are continuing to consider Daniel for discipleship today. And though it is understandably tempting to give priority to some of the more dramatic and well-known stories of Daniel, like 
the lion's den miracle or the fiery furnace miracle. And it must be said, those who'd be so helpful in terms of grappling with radical discipleship. In spite of that, I want to actually give priority to chapter 9 of Daniel because it sets before us the lesser glamorized discipline for disciples, the discipline of prayer. The bulk of this chapter is literally the spoken prayer of Daniel himself. And I want to suggest that it does so in no less radical parameters. Now, before we even get into the specifics of Daniel's model prayer, there are critical uh, contextual elements that surround this prayer that I think are as important for radical discipleship as the prayer itself. The first of these comes to us in verse 2. So if you look closely with me and have your finger right in the text, I had a professor in my graduate studies who was always saying, put your finger in the text, see it yourself. So I urge you, put your finger in verse 2 of chapter 9. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, observed in the books the number of the years which was revealed as the word of the Lord to Jeremiah, the prophet for the completion of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. What is clearly drawn to our attention in this element of the contextual background to Daniel's prayer is, of course, a priority for the word of the Lord. In this case, it, as it specifically relates to the prophet Jeremiah. And the text affords this almost onerous seriousness by the language that clearly highlights Daniel so as uh, to distinguish him from others, saying, Ani Daniel, I, Daniel. As an Hebraic way to make clear that something distinguishing is to follow. Ani Daniel, I, Daniel. And this form of distinguishing is only increased in this passage, this verse, by the Hebrew grammar that follows with the verb observed. I, Daniel, observed binothi, which is a particular Hebrew form of the verb called the hifil. I talked with you a little bit about the hithpael. This is a different form. Hith, hifil, which intensifies it as causative and active suggesting something very, very critical that Daniel gave what we could call, better translate, studious attention to the word of the Lord. Not just observed, my translation is a little bit weak. It's a big difference. I observed in the word, I gave studious attention to this word of God. And then, of course, we curiously want to know, or we ought to want to know, just what Daniel gave such studious attention to. And the text tells us very explicitly, doesn't it? Asher Hayad Devar Yahweh, which was the word of the Lord. Devar Yahweh, the word of God. If then you skip down to verse 13, so put your finger in verse 13, this is reiterated as part of the prayer itself, but further delineated with enormous ramifications as thy truth, 
As it is written in the law of Moses, all this calamity has come upon us, for we have not sought the favor of the Lord our God by turning from our iniquity and giving attention to thy truth. But my point for our chamber fest uh, community this week is hugely an important one, and it is this. Radical praying is not something that occurs in a vacuum, but is the result of and concomitant with a serious attention, devotion, to the word of the Lord. And in fact, referencing this word of the Lord and thus believing it to be so as thy truth. The word of God as the truth, as God determines it. The word of the Lord not just interesting, not just suggestive, not just potentially therapeutic for you, but the truth. Radical disciples actually believe God's word is true and the truth. In all of the Women and men I know who have served Jesus well, they take this word of God with such seriousness as the truth of God. And I believe when we pray radically, it is not in a vacuum, it's in the context of how we treat <coughs> God's truth. I'm convinced that if radical discipleship is our goal, then radical allegiance to the truth of the word of God is demanded of you, of me. There is a second element that is critical from the perspective of the contextual framework around this prayer. Actually, it comes to us in the aftermath of the prayer. As the content of the message delivered via uh, angelic visitation through the man Gabriel, mentioned in verse 21, but his words are spoken out in verses 24 to 26. Put your finger in the text. Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people. This is the message via the man Gabriel and your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy place so you are to know and discern that from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah, the prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be built again with plaza and moat even in times of distress. <laughs> then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off. The identity of who is envisioned in this prophetic message from Gabriel, designated as the anointed one, Mashicha, or as the prince, Nagid, the prince, is uh, understandably debated. Who is this referred to? Some scholars, preferring a more immediate historical placement, suggest possibly Zerubbabel, the civil leader who comes a bit later, or a later Joshua, the high priest, or what is called the Antiochian interpretation that places this 
in the second century BC, while others see it as definitively a Christological intent, meaning, of course, a messianic prophecy with a clear Christ focus in view. And yet others offer what is basically both and. That includes a contemporary fulfillment as per Daniel's time and situation, but also is meant to evoke the longer range eternal setting which is clearly projecting a Messiah. So I'm here to settle the debate. <laughs> <laughs> I personally, although I respect all the scholars, I personally do not hesitate to read the text at all as very much a Christological, that is, alerting us to the necessity of a Christ-focused discipleship, a Christological forecast for four reasons. First, the literal term Mashiha, which is picked up later as the one, the one who is anointed, is picked up as definitely referring to Jesus, the Messiah. Two, the description and language used in verses 24 to 26 are too closely related, aren't they, to the person of Christ as to be coincidental as in to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, and the phrase that the Messiah will be cut off, suggestive of the crucifixion. Third is the fact that Christ has already been clearly introduced in the book of Daniel in the Son of Man vision of chapter 7, which, by the way, we will, in fact, examine in our last uh, chapel time of this week on Friday. And fourth is the testimony that Messianic interpretation of this passage appeared earlier in Christian exegesis, that is toward the end of the second century Christian era, while the other interpretations, particularly the Antiochian interpretation, came a full 100 years later than that and was in fact first proposed by a pagan opponent of Christianity, Porphyry, and only in the late 4th century was it ever espoused by Christian scholarship. All of that leads me to say I really have no trouble seeing this as pointing us to the Messiah, Jesus himself. So that yes, I do think this contextual aftermath to the prayer of Daniel is precisely meant to alert us as to a particular focus that is critical to praying that has radical discipleship in view. And that focus is none other than openly Christological, openly focused on Jesus. That is that we are intentionally Christ-centered, intentionally Christ-oriented, intentionally Christ-focused disciples that so impacts our praying. Radical praying that eventuates in radical discipleship will always give attention and promote the purposes of Christ and his kingdom. And then finally, there is just one last bit of very important contextual consideration. 
that informs this prayer of Daniel chapter 9. And we will give just a few minutes of attention to that before we uh, conclude and move on into our day. Actually, there are quite a few other uh, bits and bobs, as they say in Scotland, in terms of the context that would be very helpful to add in here, but because of time, I'll just limit it to these three that we were talking about. This last contextual informant, as we might call it, comes to the fore in verses 21 to 23. Put your finger in the text. While I was still speaking in prayer, in the very midst of the praying, then the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision previously, came to me in my extreme weariness. As a follower of God's ways and Jesus, do you ever just feel kind of weirdy? The battle you're in is weirding. In my extreme weariness about the time of the evening offering, he gave me instruction and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you insight with understanding. At the beginning of your supplications, the command was issued. And I have come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed. So give heed to the message and gain understanding of the vision. I wish we had time to fully deal with all the particulars in just those three verses. To be reminded of how God looks upon the radical disciple. You are highly esteemed. Where do you draw your accolade? Is it because of your performance? Or from the message of God? You are highly esteemed. we don't have time. <laughs> but I want to draw attention to this, that there surely in this aftermath context is meant to encourage us as to the effectual nature of prayer, which is simply to say prayer actually makes a difference. It's not just words into the sky. It incites God into motion in this context. In that it does what I refer to as inciting activity within the supernatural counsels of God. According to verse 23, put your finger in the text, Daniel's praying is the commencing point. His praying is the beginning point for supernatural engagement as it records at the beginning of your supplications. The command was issued. What command? And by whom? Well, certainly by God, but in good Hebraic theology, it is also clearly referencing God in consultation with the broader assembly of the heavenly council, meaning God's administrative center, not some esoteric heaven. And commanding what? Why, a response, of course, to Daniel's prayer. Via the very suggestive language of a command that is issued. Yatsa davar. The word sent forth the command of God to his heavenly messengers. His counsel. 
none other than supernatural decrees ordered in response to what? To Daniel's praying. Supernatural decrees ordered in response to human prayer activity. I love this because it reminds me that prayer actually does something. Not just in my spirit, which it certainly does, but in God's activity. It is to assure you and me, among other things, that prayer incites the very counsels of God into action. And the text wants to assure us as to the reality and the effectual nature of our praying by highlighting a particular chronology, as this text specifies, at the beginning of your supplications. Right away, when you go to God, Something is set in motion because he honors radical praying. Prayer, never forget, never doubt, instigates supernatural involvement. Now that sounds good, but do you really believe it? Do you really live in accord with that? Thus, you see, the passage in Daniel 9 serves to reverse the order. For here, radical discipleship is defined, at least in part, by actually believing in the efficacy of prayer. That is, that prayer actually incites God himself and the very council of heaven into action. And I want to suggest that radical disciples actually, actually believe that and live it out. Some of you know that my work in Scotland Half of it is teaching in a theological college, but the other half is in a, now in a ministry of a church called the Upper Room, and it's all Muslim background refugees, asylum seekers, about 200 and some now. Just a week ago, tomorrow, Thursday, I had the great joy of participating in baptizing 27 Muslim background people who have met Christ this year. It was a long baptism. (laughs) But at the heart of the upper room, we love to sing, we love to preach the word, we, we love to introduce people to moving towards Jesus, but at the heart of it is something we call the prayer chair. Every gathering ends with go upstairs and sit in the prayer chair and we will pray for God's activity in your life. And we have seen just amazing answers because we actually say to people, we're here, this prayer chair is not just perfunctory. We believe when we pray in the name of Jesus, different than Islam, in the name of Jesus, the councils of heaven are activated. And I wish I could just tell you, answer to prayer after prayer after prayer, not always as we expect, but definitely God involved. It's based on the prayer chair. And that's kind of tough for me because I had hoped it was based on my great teaching. (laughs) Uh Uh-uh, it's the prayer. It's what they come for. They have to 
hear me through English translated to Farsi, translated to Arabic, it's not easy. <laughs> but prayer. And so, dear young women and men of Chamber Fest, Daniel's entire life experience, even in the perimeter of it, that is, even in the contextual background or framework to his radical approach to praying, challenges us with three vital questions, and we conclude with this, and I ask you, maybe be so academic as to write these down or remember them or come to me and I'll speak to you about them. Three vital questions based on just the context of this prayer. Is the truth of the word of God demonstrable priority in my life? Number two, is the purpose of my life openly Christological, Christ-focused, Christ-oriented, Christ-centered? And third, do I actually believe that prayer moves God and all of heaven into action? I suggest that whether or not you or I approximate radical discipleship like unto someone named Daniel to any degree is determined by how we answer those three questions. Is the truth of the word of God demonstrably a priority in my life? Is the purpose of my life openly Christ-centered? Do I actually believe that prayer changes the world. And all of that, we haven't even gotten to the prayer itself, which we will do tomorrow. Jesus, thank you so much for Daniel chapter 9. And I thank you for these incredible students. Pray for them as they go now to work musically, that interwoven into their musical progress will be these questions about your word, Christ-focused life, the efficacy of prayer. Thank you for what you're doing. I pray that today would be really fruitful. Thank you for Chris Wu, who's with us now, and bless him as he coaches and aids the ongoing coaching that all of this would come together for a Saturday performance of this great chamber work that's so infused with Jesus. We commit this day to you in Christ's name. Amen.